album comes out April 8th on Ear Music. It's called The Elephants of Mars. It's good to have him back. The guitar alien himself, Joe Satriani. Hello, Joe. Oh, there we go. It's how to do that. <laughs> the, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Yeah, and thank you. I, I know the guitar players like to have the guitar around them when they do their thing, and, and, that, and that's cool. Comedians have nothing to hide behind, you know, like but you guys yeah. have your guitar, and you do it so well. And we just had a little taste, Joe, of uh, the first single, Sahara. And yeah. so it, it, this leads into the first thing I wanted to ask you, and be honest with me. I mean, you know, when, when I see it's called Sahara and I listen to the track, I kind of, you know, I start like imagining, you know, I'm like in a Paul Bowles novel, Sheltering Sky, I'm going out for <laughs> tea in the Sahara. But is there really <laughs> any method to the madness of naming an instrumental song? I mean, did, did it really feel like the Sahara to you or just you were reading a book about the Sahara and that was it? Ah, th those are all good questions there. Um, I'll tell you, the story is funnier, and it's kind of tragic in, in a way. Uh, so I, I come into the studio, and I'm overwhelmed with this, you know, feeling of this character who's, like, really lost inside, and he finds himself in, like, a, you know, after midnight in Gotham, New York City, whatever. It's trashed. It's empty it's a big void and he is having an anxiety attack about this sort of extreme loneliness. And he starts to just spew out all this stuff. And then he cut and then he gets visited by this deity. And she says to him, love is the answer. And, and he's really angry at this answer because he can't figure out how is love going to solve his problems? It, it's just too big. Right. Yeah. And so he, start screaming it and I'm thinking you know about my keyboard player who's a great singer a guy named Ray Thistlethwaite how he could get the whole audience to to scream love is the answer but the sound of his voice it belies the, what he's saying he's actually he doesn't believe it and so he's screaming it kind of like John Lennon or uh, uh, you know Kurt Cobain screaming a lyric but the sound of his voice is saying something else that's different you know contradicting the, the lyrical message and anyway i wrote the lyrics i did the demo i played everything i sent it to the band and it was kind of like crickets you know <laughs> it was like oh <laughs> that's not you know so that's the tragic part right right so and because and, i'm not really good at writing lyrics but i did sort of tell the truth you know about how i was feeling so maybe a month goes by and uh my producer eric says to me you know that song's really great but how about if it was an instrumental? So I had to go back and get rid of the melody that was supporting all the words because it's really a different animal. You know, you don't really need much melody when you've got very strong words. But if you don't have any words, you better have a great melody. So I had to kind of reconfigure it. And we did a little rearranging, but the basic vibe, the chords, the groove, you know, all the lines, uh, the original solo, everything stayed like it was on the demo. So the song really did take a kind of a funny journey. But the whole thing about Sahara is that he's in a spiritual desert and uh, he and he's lost and he doesn't know how to get out of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm from Jersey. I'm not that deep. So I would I would never read that into it, Joe. But because <laughs> it sounds like, man, you could have a graphic novel based on this and all kinds of stuff. But I guess the obvious question is for a guy who's primarily known as an instrumental artist. Uh, why did you decide to write this as a lyrical piece? OK, so, well, this is even funnier. You know, <laughs> um, we go back the last record, Shape Shifting. Uh, you know, we, we, we did the videos. ZZ did this great video for me for the song 1980. And it's January uh, 2020. And we booked the tour for April. And the record comes out April 15th, I think it was. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, lockdown for the world. And we're wondering, like, well, what are we going to do? So we figure, let's release the single, the video. Uh, let's release the album. How long can this lockdown last? Three months. So we go, yeah, three months. Great. So we're, you know, waiting at home and all of a sudden six months and I'm starting to think I'm going to go crazy sitting at home. And I thought, what if, you know, we, we record 
uh, two albums, a vocal album and an instrumental album to show off the new band. And then by the time we hit the road, we give these two supplemental albums uh, away to to help push the new album, which was still new at the time, Shapeshifting. Yep. Well, well, that, you know, as you know, six months later, it was like, well, how about another six months you know, <laughs> of staying at home? And I realized, boy, that by the time I come out, people are going to think, thanks for shapeshifting. But what if, you know, what have you recorded lately? <laughs> <laughs> so th- that's when I thought, well, OK, I'll I got to revamp the idea. Let's just make the instrumental record that I really should be making. So I I created some parameters. I said, you're going to write better, arrange better. You're going to play better and you got to put a team together that's going to make the whole thing sound better and so how, how are we going to do that and so i started kind of from scratch and some of the songs like sahara still you know went from the vocal album into the uh, instrumental album and everybody signed on you know kenny aronoff and brian beller drums and bass and ray who was still i gotta say he's you know he's been in the band for two years i've never met him <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is common now, Joe, The people are yeah. playing on albums with other people they've never met. I know, it's crazy. So um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but it, it, you know, in the end, it was, a, it was a good thing for me to do because I really did need to sort of raise my standard of, of how I make records. And it was great not to be working against the clock and the calendar. Uh, and, and that way I could actually deliver better performances and there was nobody around to make fun of me when i made mistakes which was <laughs> important all right well we're gonna get, we're gonna get to joe satriani's mistakes in a, a little bit but and if i don't know if you've been to new york city lately but you believe me you would wish it was an empty gotham just like in the song uh, uh, uh not not good here joe not good but um i'll think of sahara when i'm wandering around late at night by myself um uh, the title even of the album is interesting um i was I, at first i thought rob zombie was uh naming your albums uh the, <laughs> the elephants of mars so where where does that come from um well i i had this song right and um it had this weird sound in it and it always reminded me of this sort of gigantic elephant snorts you know that sort of followed the the musical side of it and uh, I, I had like what, uh, what I call like a mini song. It was like a, a three minute version of what I thought should eventually be about, you know, maybe about five minutes long. And uh, I, I sent it to Eric as he was saying, send me everything you got, even if it's got no guitar on it or whatever. And, and he loved it. And, and I was happy that he liked it because I wanted to expand it into a full song. So I started thinking more about, well, you know, what's my motivation here? Be, you know, how am I going to fill it out if I don't know what the song's really about? And uh, so I came up with this idea that in the future, uh, the scientists of Earth uh, terraform Mars and they turn it into a beautiful garden <laughs> planet. Uh, and But unbeknownst to them, they created in this little pocket of Mars uh, these gigantic sentient elephants. I mean, they have telepathy, <laughs> they think like smart humans. And the colonists there that have been working for the evil corporations of Earth get together with these elephants. And the leader, of course, plays Brock Tar. And, uh, and they decide they're going to lead a revolution to take Mars back and keep it a pristine, beautiful garden planet. And they're going to fight back the evil corpse of, uh, of Earth that just want to take all the minerals and water out of it. And I got real excited about this. I called <laughs> Ned Evett, my, my writing partner, at uh, Satch Tunes, and we, you know, got this story crystallized. He wrote up a whole script. He did the sequel, the prequel. So right now it's a full science fiction story. Then I could turn around and tell the band this whole crazy idea, which <laughs> sort of got everybody in the mood to relax and be fun and have fun with it. <laughs> it's really a rock and song, you know? And, and so the whole idea of the rock and roll character with the elephants that was key to get them in the mood, you know, so. 
I this mean, is how I- yeah. So I, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, well. First of all, you know, you work with Kenny Aronoff, who was who's been on the show, and just hearing his schedule made me exhausted. I, he doesn't have time to listen to this whole story about elephants on Mars and everything. I mean, the guy is. A complete freak of nature. I mean, he's he's he really is amazing, and uh, you know he's been with you the last few albums. So obviously that's worked out with you guys. He's been able to. You guys have been able to find common time to collaborate. Yeah, he's absolutely yeah a force of nature. He's crazy. He's just completely crazy. But he happens to be a world class drummer that makes a sound that is godlike. He yeah. just. I don't know what what's in the fingertips there, but when he goes like that and he hits a drum, it's better than the way anybody else does it. And I, I've seen it happen. I've taken the drumstick quickly from his hands <laughs> and done it myself, and it doesn't work. So it's definitely it's it's him. Uh, uh, we we had so much fun, you know, on the the Hendrix Experience Hendrix tours that yeah. we did in 2019, and it was better than the fun we had when we when he was in Chickenfoot uh, a decade ago. Uh, but uh, this time around was really different for both of us because we weren't doing this sort of classic rock in the studio thing, like with shape shifting. And I really, I remembered how crazy <clears throat> he was on that Hendrix tour. He could really go off. You know, a lot of people know him as being Mr. Solid, but actually I, I kind of prefer it when he's completely out of control. And so this album allowed him to do both, I think, to, to go as far out as he's ever been recorded, but then also to lay it down like what you expect when you hear Kenny play drums. Right. Well, yeah, he can, quote unquote, let his hair down um, doing, (laughs) you know, giving a little bit more than maybe what people know about him. But I mean, you're right. He's just such a a solid player. And and, and that leads into, you know, the question of style, you know, and, and you always give such props to the musicians that you work with. But you know, when I listen to one of your records, Joe, they're always unmistakably you. But as you That's mentioned good. before, you wanted to do something a little different, maybe go to another level with this. And so when you do listen, when I listen to a Joe Satriani album, Unstoppable Momentum is going to s- sound different from Surfing with the Alien. It's going to yeah. s- uh, sound different than um, the album you did with Chad and Glenn Hughes. So, But, but yet yeah. it, it's still you. So do, do you go in with a certain, I want to have a certain feel for this, or do you just start playing and it, kind of creates itself no i have to figure out the vibe ahead of time i really do it's expensive if you decide to hire guys like you know chad and you know to come in uh you got to find you know 10 days where he's not working (laughs) first of all like with kenny it's really tough and uh but every minute you're in the studio it's costing hundreds, thousands of dollars, because you've got all these expensive people around and you're in an expensive room, like Sunset Sound or, or uh, Skywalker or something like that. And um, so I have to come in really clear and they really want to know from me, what's the vibe? Like, how far can I go? How should I should I hold back? And, you know, what, what should my drum sound like? Do you want the little snare or the big snare, you know? All, all that kind of stuff. So I have to be really prepared. Um, I don't think the only time I've done albums where we haven't been prepared uh, were the two chicken foot albums, because we never knew when we were going to record. Yeah. <laughs> it was always like, you know, 24 hours before we would hit the studio, somebody would start, you know, phone tag. And before you know it, it's like, bring a guitar, come to Sam's. We, we'll, you know, we got a day and a half, that kind of thing. Bring socks, <laughs> you know, uh, and that has its charm. And you do get some really cool performances from that attitude. But you don't get to tinker. You don't get to polish. You know, um, if the band's strength is in its chaos, then yeah. that's a great way to do it. But, you know, I mean, you wouldn't force Pink Floyd to do it. You'd never get Dark Side of the Moon. You know, you don't force the Eagles to do it. You wouldn't get Hotel California. So, uh, but... You know, uh, there are other bands that really do sound better when they're captured live, you know, because that's sure. they're good at being crazy and loose and out of control. So uh, I like to pull it together so I can instruct everybody as to what the parameters are. 
the only difference is this record didn't have any. That was the the cool thing about it. That was the parameter was no, no press. Yeah. So we could do any style we want. And and yeah, the record just goes like all over the place. It's really a lot of fun. Yeah. And you released a, a brand new single, I think today or yesterday, called Fearless. Yeah. So that's out there as well, right? Faceless. Faceless, I'm sorry. So that, yeah. that's out there as well. The album comes out uh, April the 8th on Ear Music. It's called The Elephants of Mars. Um, yes. And related to, the, um, to what we were just speaking about, you know, on the show last week, I was talking to Vernon Reed about this new generation of guitar players that are coming up who have, you know, basically learned by watching YouTube and uh, by utilizing current technology like light up fretboards and things like this. And then you coincidentally, you made some headlines speaking kind of about the same thing where you said there's a lot of great players out there on Facebook and Instagram. But Joe, you know, back in the day, you know, you would have to go to the, the, the guitar shop and take lessons in the back and your parents would have to take you down there or this and that. <laughs> but how do you get from someone who's young, who's up and coming, instead of mimicking what they see on YouTube or wherever to creating their own style. How do they make that jump? I think it could be uh, instantaneous. I, I mean, the, the level of talent I've seen on Instagram, let's say, is completely off the charts. I mean, the young player's ability to achieve complexity and technical prowess and speed is unlike anything we've ever seen before. It really is. In the history of electric guitar, there's never been a more prepared, technically talented group of young players. Unfortunately, the 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 pop world does not really is not really interested in guitar players playing this kind of stuff. But I know as being a lifelong guitar player that this is truly a remarkable moment. Uh, and and these young players are doing things that my generation does it can't touch and and uh, uh, but we need to help them we need to tell the world that they're out there doing stuff I truly believe that given the opportunity that any one of these players that maybe gets branded as being you know hyper technical uh, given the opportunity they would learn in a second how to connect with an audience but it, w it would take a, a couple of local clubs to allow that to happen uh, as you said you know for, for guys like me, we grew up in bars playing in front of people before we knew how to play. I mean, it was ridiculous. I had gigs everywhere, and I basically learned on stage in backyards, high school dances, bars that I was too young to be in, stuff like that. And uh, But you pick up quick, you know. I mean, the human potential is is really remarkable. So And, and these guys have a head start. They really do. The young men and women are playing stuff that is just so incredible. Uh, and and I think once the world starts to reward them, they'll start to write those melodies, they'll start to become performers. Uh, right now, they're great at doing it for the phone. I can't do that. I mean, I can talk when I'm looking at the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I just I don't know but that's but 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 you you hit on something that Vernon also said which was you know without the live component you know it's it, it really it's really d tough to distinguish yourself until you get on the live situation and you know I was just on the Monsters of Rock cruise uh, that I hosted with Eddie and Jim from that metal show and I judged a, a so you think you can shred contest not because I know anything about music they just want a comedian to say funny stuff but I was there with uh, Gus G and Nita Strauss and Joel Hoekstra, all accomplished people, and they followed this one particular... Joel, Go ahead. Sorry. I got to say, Joel, Joel Hoekstra is simply too tall. Let's just <laughs> say that right now. I, I actually I met him once. Uh, I think it was at the Classic Rock Awards. And I literally, like, my neck hurt from, you know, he was very great. <laughs> Yeah. And I just thought, well, how how did he get born? What what happened to me? I'm sitting there struggling <laughs> at five foot eight and this this God, you know. Right. And, and the hair and everything. And I've seen him, uh, you know, pictures of him playing with the Siberian Orchestra and he's playing one of my chrome guitars. And it and I swear it looks like <laughs> it's like this big. You know what I mean? It's just like <laughs> 
sorry, sorry. I interrupted you. I'm very sorry. Go no, ahead. no. I was. <laughs> that's great. I, I can't wait to show Joel this. But um, <laughs> no, he came out of the womb as a rock star somehow. But yes, he, yes. but but yes, but but also a very uh, a very. Uh, well accomplished player but there was a guy in the contest who they all followed on one of the social media platforms i don't want to embarrass the guy uh but he's known as a shredder guy and he happened to be on the cruise and he uh joined the contest uh, but when he got up there joe in front of the judges and the crowd he was not the guy he was uh, on his social media account and that's where the live thing if you can't bring yeah. it live it's tough. Yeah, it is tough. But uh, but I swear, give him a week or two, and you know that's exactly uh, that experience that he had. You know, on the cruise is exactly what he needed. Every performer goes through that where they walk off stage and they go, "What just happened? How come that went all wrong?" You know, <laughs> don't you know? Note to self: Don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, I, that's almost every night for me, Joe. But. Um, <laughs> But now I don't want to I don't want to forget this because it's important because not only is there new music out by Joe Satriani, uh, you have uh, actual artwork painting um, yep. that you've been out showcasing with the Wentworth Galleries, who have been uh, I'm sure they do tons and tons of uh artwork with people but i know them from doing it specifically with uh rock and rollers and so uh this is a legit thing joe this wasn't like oh uh, you know some people go oh i love coffee and they put coffee out but you come <laughs> fr actually from a family of artists yes uh i i'm sort of like the late bloomer um when i was growing up my two older sisters uh, you know, got degrees in fine art and went on to be artists. I married an artist when she was getting her degree in uh, graphic arts. Uh, our son wound up getting a degree in studio art and filmmaking. And so I was, you know, maybe about eight years ago, I said, hey, you know, can you teach me uh, what I should know about brushes and, and you know, paints and canvases? Because all I knew was from sketching, made a lot of guitar straps and picks and merchandise and posters. Uh, I'd done a, a, a digital art book, but uh, I never really got my hands dirty, you know. And so uh, Rabina was very kind at, to, you know, s sit me down and say, okay, this is a brush. This is when you use it for this kind of thing. And if you want to blend this color with that color, you do that. So I slowly worked on it. And uh, when I was doing a, a session for the guys at scene four, you know, where they, they uh, do time exposure of photographs of musicians in the dark wearing these LED lace gloves. And you've seen, I'm sure you've seen Chad and, and a bunch of guys uh, who have been photographed like this. They create these beautiful yes. pieces of artwork. And uh, so I started showing them my stuff. Then we did some mixed media stuff together. Um, and then eventually they introduced me to Christian, who uh, owns the Wentworth Gallery. And he got very interested in commission, uh, you know, he wants 300 things. I've only given him about 120 so far, but it's kind of tough <laughs> to crank them out. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm learning though that, you know, how I can uh, harness my time a little better. It's funny at this age, I'm finally getting around to the, the discipline of harnessing my time better, but I love painting. I absolutely love it. And, uh, uh, it's almost as fun as playing guitar. <laughs> Nothing's better than that. But <laughs> well, yeah, well, listen. I mean, over the last couple of years, Joe, what a great time to stretch your creative muscle when we were all trapped in our homes. And you know, I I noticed that again. You know, we're talking to Vern last week about it, and he said, you know, I started scoring a lot more than I ever did, and you know, writing for different kinds of projects and video games and things. And you know, for you, obviously, this is something you've wanted to do. Here's the opportunity yeah. to finally do it. Now Wentworth jumps on board. And I want to mention the local one to where to where we are right now, which will be in the Short Hills Mall on March yeah. the 12th. Um, they have a Wentworth gallery in there. And J Joe, you'll be there, correct? Yes. Yeah. It's really cool. I swear. You walk into a gallery and you see a painting that you did on the wall. It's like hearing your song on the radio for the first time. It's really freaky. <laughs> You just, it's it's really <laughs> freaky, but uh, I love it. And uh, we did uh, a few weeks ago, I did two shows in Miami with the Wentworth. And I swear it was like being on tour again, just meeting 
the fans talking to them about the artwork like you would talk to them about the albums or the songs and uh i boy did i miss it i realized that right then and there like how much i thrive on that interaction so i'm looking forward to the show uh you know at, at the short hills location. yeah and I, and I heard rumor the 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 great eddie trunk will probably stop down and hang out <laughs> so and then he has that uh, he has threatened that although I, I always imagine now that he's sort of living in las vegas that you know He's, he's got sunglasses on, a baseball cap, maybe a cigar, and he's sitting at a poker table. Yeah. Well, he's he's splitting his time between both coasts, but um, but uh, but we all live in Jersey, so come out and uh, support. I don't think I don't we, we don't have the TV show anymore, so I don't think we can afford any of your artwork. But uh, <laughs> we will be there in in solidarity. There you go, Wentworth Galleries, and they've done um, you know Rick Allen from Def Leppard does some yeah. great work, and Brian Wheat from Tesla as well. So you know you're in great company, it's, and Charlie Benante from Anthrax as well. Really great stuff from the Rockers, man. Yes, yeah, it's spread you know Paul Stanley all the way to yes. Peter Mac. Yeah. Uh, amazing. I got to see some original Peter Max stuff and wow, uh, that guy understood color like nobody else. Amazing. Well, well, but you understand it, you know, on the guitar as well, you know, because there are different colors and and shades yeah. to the things that you played. And of course, we all know you as uh, a guitar guru, a maestro, however you want to say it. But <laughs> what I want to know, and I told you I get back to this for you. Okay. What what do you feel like is your weakness as a guitar player? Um, uh, I'm uh, spaced out. Total space cadet, and um, uh, I sh I, I should probably uh, work things out before I start playing. But because my nature is to uh, to skirt danger when music is involved, I always wind up trying stuff that maybe I should have worked out ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's I always think about that, and it's the the funny thing about that is that. For some reason, knowing that about myself, I put together G3 where I stand next to two other guys who are going to shred me to death and do it every <laughs> night, night after night. Yeah, I mean, you'd think I would like do the opposite if I knew hmm. that I had that issue, but I a glutton for punishment, maybe. I don't know. But it's the only way you learn. You know, you stand next to John Petrucci. And you go, okay, now that's a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, may, no, may, maybe, <laughs> Joe, because you're so controlled in, in the studio when you do your own projects that when you, when you, go, you get into a live situation, perhaps you, you want to walk the tightrope a little bit more, that sort of, that, the, that element of danger that rock and roll is supposed to have. Yes, I, I think so. I think that's, and, and probably I need to be psychoanalyzed. I, I bet that. Uh, psychiatrist might say, you know, uh, it's classic case of, uh, <laughs> you know, repressed uh, personality that re that is really extroverted because I'm like basically always feel really shy. And then I really don't want to walk out on stage. And then as soon as I walk out on stage, I become like, wow. you know, somebody else. And afterwards I go, who was that guy? You know. <laughs> so, I don't know. You may be onto something there. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, as you know, I'm a performer as well. And some, you know, sometimes you just go out there and you go, you know what? I'm just, I'm, I kind of know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to also kind of wing it. And, and that, that yeah. sort of that adrenaline rush is, is powerful. And, and if it, it look, no pain, no gain, but you know, if it yeah. works, you are gold for the next whatever amount of time. And if it doesn't, then yeah, that's when you, you know, I never, I never saw a comic or mus musician rewrite like their whole set when they killed. <laughs> if you have a bad night, you're like, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to go for the after drink, uh, after show drink. I'm going to go back to the hotel and work on my stuff. But that's the danger of it, and, and I think I think that's an important part of the music that we love. Yeah, I, I and uh, I think sometimes if you prepare too much, when things go wrong, as they always do, you it's too jarring. Yeah, and though it's sort of an interesting protective mechanism not to be too well planned. So that when things go wrong, you go, okay, I'll just play with that. You yeah. know, pedal didn't work. You know, somebody <laughs> threw something at me. Bass player's amp blew up, whatever it is. You go, okay, I can deal with that, you know. Right. And that's an important part, I think. Certainly, I would say even if you're at home recording by yourself, you have to relax and forget about what you thought might happen. 
you really have to get into the idea of not being judgmental while you're doing it. You, otherwise, you just really you're sort of hindering yourself. You know, you really have to try to be free. Yeah, stay when, in the mo- stay in the moment, and 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 maybe well, was that a challenge for you as far as being a painter, not to continually step back and go, oh, that doesn't look like, but to just be in the moment while you're painting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying. (laughs) (laughs) It's tough, right? (laughs) I'm trying. I, I I think I, sometimes I get really down on myself if, you know, I just thought, oh, I need a straight line here. And I just, you know, it's all, (laughs) I go, what is that? You know, (laughs) But you do have to go with it. And uh, so that's a good thing. Well, my wife is here looking over me while I'm painting and she's encouraging me to just go with it. And, yeah. and you know, she's had the experience. So it, it helps. Yeah, that's it's great to have that support system. Uh, a couple quick ones. I'll let you go, man. Uh, to- touring plans for the new record. Uh, we definitely are putting it all together for the fall in the U.S., Uh, and, uh, Kenny and Brian and Ray are are all on board. I am like waiting, like, it seems like every eight hours I wait for another call from Europe to find out if the spring tour is happening or if we're going to announce that we have to postpone it once again. Uh, so I I don't have any news on that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in the meantime, uh, I'm trying to keep myself well rehearsed and I'm having fun, uh, painting. Uh, and and traveling around a little bit now, which is kind of nice. I can get out and, and meet people at these galleries. Yeah, yeah, and still get to contact with the fans. Is, do you have? Is there any? What's the one necessity that Joe Satriani must have when he's out touring on the road? Do you have you know like lucky underwear or something? <laughs> That's a good idea. I, I don't know why I never thought of that. Um, no, I think uh, coffee. That's what it is. Okay. I love really good espresso in the morning and you really can't get that anywhere unless you decide you want to go out before you've become a full human being, which it's better to have the coffee first, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> become Always. a full human being and then go out. <laughs> I, I, I agree a hundred percent. I did. Do you have, do you have a specific uh, coffee brand you like or, uh, you know, Pete's Italian roast is really good. Oh. And in a pinch, uh, uh, Starbucks espresso is pretty good and we make it really strong. So yeah, it's, we, yeah, it's, it's deadly stuff. I, oh, I, yeah. a few cups to friends and you know, eh, yeah, I get off. <laughs> <laughs> See folks, even superstars like Joe Satriani drink the same coffee that we do. Hey man, thank <laughs> you so much for your time tonight, man. And, uh, can't wait to see you on the road again. I haven't seen you since the uh, Hendrix experience. I always love watching you play live and uh, look forward to the album. It's called The Elephants of Mars, and it's out April the 8th. Please pre-order it right now and um, and enjoy. And, Joe, I'll see you down the road sometime. Thank you. I really hope so, Don. You take care of yourself. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You as well, brother. Okay. Talk to you later.